Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cupola Conversations. I am Chris Stansberry, Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and the moderator actually will be John Rezik for today's program. Our program is called Gender Equity and Civil Rights in Iran. We have a great panel for this discussion today, and each one represents different parts of our campus community, all of which have been impacted uh, by situations in the last couple of weeks. We are honored to be partnering in the Division of Student Affairs with the Office of Global Affairs for today's program. If this is your first time joining us for Cupola Conversations, welcome. If you're a regular attendee, welcome back. Uh, Cupola Conversations is part of the East United initiative that started by a student leader back in 2016, along with the Division of Student Affairs. At that time, the world seemed broken, people were struggling, and things were going generally in the wrong direction. Many of us still feel like things are that way six years later. ECU United is intended, not intended to fix the entire world all at once, but rather to get the conversation started right here at ECU and grow beyond the walls of our campus. I encourage you to visit the ECU United website, ecuunited.ecu.edu, to learn more about the initiative as well as the numerous programs under the ECU United umbrella. In short, it's about one student, one staff member, one faculty member, along with the community, standing together to make our campus better. Part of living in a diverse community means learning to respect and appreciate varying perspectives. So a couple of ground rules for the discussion before I turn it over to John. This cupola conversation is being held virtually uh, so that we can allow more folks to be able to uh, participate. While we have gotten pretty good at the virtual world over the last couple of years, we still may have a hiccup here or there. Somebody may forget to turn a microphone on once in a while. That's okay, we'll roll with the punches as we go. Our format for today, we have great panelists. They'll be introduced in just a few minutes. Then we have some questions for you that will be coming up. We'll also wanna take audience questions if you have those for our panelists. For those watching online today, all microphones and video are muted to avoid any noise or audio interference. During the discussion, attendees, if you want to pose a question, you can use the chat feature. It's the Q&A button at the top. We have student affairs staff that are monitoring the questions, but the panelists are not. We may not be able to get every question, but we do encourage you. If you have questions, please do post them. Uh, also, Microsoft Teams has live captioning feature. You can click on the more button. It's about two thirds of the way down if you are looking for that feature. So at this time, it is my pleasure to turn things over to John Rezik with the Office of Global Affairs. John? Okay, thank you very much, Chris. As Chris mentioned, my name is John Rezik and I serve as Assistant Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs here at East Carolina University. And I would like you, I would like to welcome you to today's Cupola conversation. I will introduce our wonderful panelists today, our guests for um, our session in a few minutes. But first, I wanted to give a brief background on today's topic for those of you who maybe not followed um, all of the news. Masa Amini was a 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman who was detained by civil authorities in Iran, often called the morality police, for improperly wearing the hijab. Two days later, on September 16th, Masa died in the hospital from head trauma allegedly caused while in police custody. When the story broke in Tehran, the pictures of Masa were released online, and shortly thereafter, protests broke out um, and spread to over 85 cities around Iran. Protesters called for the repeal of restrictive hijab laws and for an abolishment of the morality police. Over the past several weeks, over 50 people have been killed during protests, marking some of the most serious civil unrest in Iran in recent decades. At the heart of these protests are issues related to women's rights and gender equity. And that is the topic of today's Google conversation. My guests today are Dr. Mona Russell, an associate professor in the Department of History and a member of ECU's Gender Studies Executive Board, Dr. Lethia Cook, associate professor and department chair in the Department of Political Science, Dr. Jalil, Jalil uh, Rushendal, uh, an Iranian American and professor emeritus um, in the Department of Political Science, and I believe we're still trying to get uh, Dr. Rushendal online. And then finally, uh, very bravely um, volunteering to Join us today is Ms. Nettis Safari, um, who is an Iranian graduate student in the Department of Geography, Planning, and the Environment. So, my first question to our panelists today is uh, for Dr. Russell. From your perspective, can you explain the historic significance of what is occurring in Iran right now? 
Yes, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me here, and I'm a little sorry that I'm in the dark. I thought I had more sunlight, but it's that time of year. I'm going to go through seven points in Iranian history very briefly. I'm going through a couple of thousand years, so bear with me. Point number one, the veil has had different meanings at different times, and so for hundreds of years, even prior to the rise of Islam in the seventh century, veiling existed in the ancient Near East and in Persian empires as a means of identifying women who were under the protection of men. And after the rise of Islam, this meaning evolved also to express a devotion to one God. So now I'm going to shoot forward in time to the turn of the 20th century. So by the time that we get to the turn of the 20th century in Iran, veiling was common amongst Muslims, but also Christians and Jews and Zoroastrians in Iran. There was debate and discussion amongst intellectuals about unveiling, but interestingly enough, if we look at people who we would term feminists in Iran at the turn of the 20th century, they were not particularly interested in unveiling. What they were interested in was education. That was their foremost concern. Other topics of interest to them were banning polygamy and reforming divorce laws. So veiling was not their big concern. Point number three, Reza Shah, who's the founder of modern Iran, who is the father of the Shah who was ousted in 1979. In 1936, he banned the hijab. I should also say that he reformed clothing laws for men as well. He enforced the wearing of Western style suits in government buildings, as well as the wearing of the Pahlavi hat. Um, that is, and it was only for you know people who were entering sort of Western government, or I should say government buildings. In terms of who this actually affected for women, it most affected um, women who were going to government schools and people who were riding public transportation in cities and going into offices and work people who worked in government offices. But Reza Shah also sent out undercover police in the provinces to monitor those areas that women went to the most, places like the bathhouse, um, that is the entrance of the bathhouse, uh, to the newly emerging cinemas that were highly popular, to the marketplace, those places that women went to, and he cracked down on them. Um, so this was highly unpopular. On top of this, to add insult to injury, prostitutes were not allowed to unveil. This was in contradistinction to um, the way that veiling had worked since ancient times. Um, that uh, so this was you know kind of a marker of of kind of women who were respectable. Now it was kind of topsy turvy, and women were quite angry and dissatisfied. Which brings me to point number four. This dissatisfaction was very apparent in the early 1950s and to very quickly summarize a situation that emerged in the early 1950s. A very popular prime minister nationalized the oil industry, which was a move that was very, very highly supported. Britain and other Western countries who were very highly invested in this oily in oil industry um, boycotted Iranian oil. The Shah, who was now Mohammad uh, Reza, the son of the founder, um, he supported the Western oil industry over his own people. This was a highly unpopular move, which caused him to actually have to flee the country. So this very unpopular move, this you know, created demonstrations in the street and women went out in the streets in their chador, that is their traditional veil, in order to demonstrate. And now the meaning of the veil had a very different meaning. It was an anti-monarchy, anti-West stance by wearing the chador to show their support for the prime minister. In the midst of these demonstrations, the United States, and here I mean the CIA, 
orchestrated counter demonstrations, which has the result of defeating the very popular prime minister and restoring the Shah back to his throne and restoring him back to power. And the people of Iran did not forget this. This brings me to point number five. The veil had very similar meanings in 1979 when the protests brought down Mohammad Reza. So women went out in the streets and protested again. Not all women wore the veil, but they did wear the veil as a sign of protest against the regime and against the West. But men and women were not unified in what type of regime that they wanted to have in 1979. And when Khomeini um, issued reveiling orders right before International Women's Day in 1979, this divided women because some women said, yes, we do want to veil, and other women said, no, we don't. And as I said, big division. Point number six. Since 1979, the government has alternated between periods of greater strictness and laxity over dress codes. And since the 19, late 1990s, bad hijab has been kind of a sign of resistance to the government as well as a sign of individualism. Bad hijab can mean anything from loosely wearing your headscarf, wearing makeup, wearing fancy accessories. Any number of things can be bad hijab, which we can talk about later. And I'll leave discussions of the government to the political scientists who are better suited to discuss them. Last point, not all women are the same. They differ by age, by class, by region, and by ethnicity. 60% of the population is under the age of 30, and the young woman who died in custody, uh, Mahsen, her name is actually uh, Zini, you might see that. It actually means life in Kurdish, and you know we should acknowledge that and remember her. I'll turn things back over to the moderator. Thank you so much, uh, Mona. Uh, I'd like to turn it over um, now to Dr. Cook. Um, and as Dr. Russell mentioned, you've studied Iran as a political scientist and have multiple publications uh, on Iran. Can you give us some of the political context behind the current unrest? Thank you very much for having me. This is really exciting and I'm happy to be um, talking about uh, issues that are very important to me and to, uh, to many people who I'm sure are attending today. Um, politically, as Dr. Russell has mentioned, there has been recent um, alternation and changes in in policies about the hijab based on who was president. And so um, the previous president, Rouhani, was a little bit more liberal. Um, it, Contextually speaking, I mean, he was a little bit more liberal. He was a little bit more, um, more perhaps Western. Um, he actually coached the morality police or instructed them to maybe not um, carefully enforce the hijab rules. Um, and there was other loosenings where, um, for instance, um, men and women that weren't related were allowed to socialize in some contexts. And so there was a little bit of freeing up under Rouhani. Well, with the the recently elected um, Raisi, the policies have become much more strict again. And so this is part of the context of what's going on. But we also have to understand the the other aspects of this problem and the, the unrest in Iranian society um, and kind of the roots that they come from. And they do come from, um, just as it happens in the United States, successive regimes um, and successive presidencies. Now, you have to also remember, though, that in the Iranian context, where in the United States, we have separation of church and state. Um, one thing that Americans kind of struggle with is the idea that in Iran, the church and the state are completely intertwined. And in fact, Khamenei has a lot of power, um, usually even more power than the president. And those presidents are generally selected by Khamenei and other clerics. And so, um, and that's part of what has led to previous um, unrest in the country. Um, so what we're seeing now in Iran, um, and I'll just kind of briefly cover a couple of items, um, is um, number one, they're experiencing economic hardship. 
Now, this has been the case for most of the world, um, especially post COVID, but in Iran, a lot of this has roots back in the the administration of Ahmadinejad, who tried to do some some probably ill-advised things um, to try to stimulate economic growth, but actually ended up hindering economic growth. And so, and in fact, they they've got the opposite. Um, so currently, they have somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% inflation, which is always going to be unsettling to a society. Um, they have a third or more of the population. It was a third of the population, like middle of last year. Um, it's expected that it's quite a bit higher now um, of the population that's living in poverty, um, according to international standards. Um, you've got bad economic um, practices that continue. They're under sanctions from the U.S. and many other countries. And then you add COVID on top of that. Um, so economically, they're struggling significantly. And the government has been unable able to deal with that successfully. And it is something that all governments struggle with. Um, they have had problems associated with um, official corruption, um, where the leaders have been caught doing things that leaders ought not do. Um, they have complaints about a lack of social and political freedom um, from society and also some issues that are coming up that are related to climate change um, that are imp impacting in some areas the availability of food. So what we've seen over the over the last how many years is that 13 years um, is actually three different periods of protest. Um, so the first one was in 2009. Um, this was re is referred to sometimes as the Green Revolution, and this was largely based on election fraud, and it was a middle class protest associated with um, complaints about the way government was functioning and what was perceived as fixed elections, which is interesting because the way that the system works, the government, I mean, usually it's the case that you can't you can't run for office in Iran unless you have the approval of the the religious hierarchy, and so it's they've always been from like a Western pr perspective, um, in some ways predetermined. Um, but it's it's gotten worse where um, when Raisi was elected in 2021, according to some reports, all other candidates were removed or were disqualified from the election, um, except for Khomeini's preferred of choice. Um, so you got, you got that in 2009. In 2017, you have protests um, associated with economic mismanagement. 2019, um, the government decided to dramatically increase fuel prices, and that resulted in um, in protests that um, had about 300 people killed. Um, and then you have the current situation where uh, the number that I saw today was 57 killed. Um, that are associated with women's rights, economic woes, and government mismanagement. Add on top of the fact that, I, what was it, um, a couple of weeks ago, Khamenei um, um, had to cancel some of his engagements um, because he was ill. Um, so he's 83 years old, and there's some concern about what the succession will look like um, if, if he comes out of power. And so all these things are kind of coming together um, to create this unrest. And one of the unique things about this current wave of protest is that according to most um, resources, it's much broader based than it has been in the past. So it's crossing religious lines, it's crossing socioeconomic lines, it's crossing ethnic lines. And so it's a much broader protest. It's also um, frequently it's been confined in the past to certain regions of the country. This has been nationwide. And so there are some that are saying that this is an existential threat to the Iranian regime. Um, and by that we mean a threat to the very existence of the regime itself um, because they've because people are now seeking to overthrow the regime rather than merely reform it. And with that, I'll be happy to answer questions later if anybody has them. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. Um, so as we are working to get our uh, third panelist um, online, I want to skip uh, then to Miss um, uh, Safari. It, so far, we've talked very much about uh, the, the political context, the economic context in which we are seeing protests, but I want to kind of bring this down to a personal level. So you as a uh, female uh, graduate student from Iran, um, in many ways, you're not unlike Ms. Amini. How have the images that you've seen um, 
from Iran, from your home country, impacted you and your uh, fellow Iranian students? Um, thanks for having me. First, I wanted to um, say some stuff regarding um, those speeches that have been uh, before. Um, I would like to say that um, the rule of hijab, people never wanted that. People just wanted freedom of right, like, and having to choose their own hijab. And even in the revolution um, in 1979, um, they didn't choose to have the hijab. They didn't want it. Even after uh, that time, uh, there was the rule that they started setting the rule for mandatory hijab, but people protested against that. Many women um, protested against that, that they didn't want it, but well, no one cared about that. But And uh, it started from them that they didn't want the rule. Uh, but uh, their, voice, their voice was not, never heard. And um, I don't want to uh, get into the political side because there are so many conflicting views, but um, I just want to say that um, before in 2019, there was more than uh, 1500 people who were killed. And um, it, it, right now it is way more than hundreds um, because the internet was shut down back then. And right now still the internet is not um, connected. Uh, so the news, I understand that people don't get news around the world and um, some news are missing, some, you know, chants are missing. Um, when I heard about Massa, it, I felt really sad because um, this is something that has been going on and is uh, happening um, to girls in my country, to the women in my country, that um, they are being arrested, they are being captured in the streets just because they are not wearing the proper hijab, um, just because they want their rights to choose the hijab they want to, uh, but they are being ignored and their voice is not heard. And um, sometimes they kill them, sometimes they arrest them. And when I heard the news, I was really sad, but what made me even enraged was the news that I heard um, of Nika, Nika Shakarmi, um, who was brutally murder murdered, raped, arrested. And um, her, they kept her for eight days. She was only 17. And um, it, it, it all happened after the protest. It's going on. It's not just one person. There are many girls and women and even men that are being killed in Iran. And just because they want their rights back, just because uh, they are fighting to get their rights back. And it's not just only about hijab. It's many rights that we don't have. Uh, we don't have the right to read whatever we want, to listen to whatever we want, to speak whatever we want. And we don't have the right to eat, drink, or whatever we want. It's, there are so many things that we don't have. And there are so many protests that has been going on that people try to fight for this, to get their rights back. As I mentioned, like even in 2019, even before that, there were so many protests that they tried to shut them down. They tried to cut their voice. And um, it, they are still trying to do that. but. Uh, this time, I'm uh, very optimistic that it's not going to be like the last time, like a, like the previous times, because it's not, I want to say it's not just about women, it's about men as well. Um, many men don't have the rights as well, the human rights. Um, and people are doing that to get their rights back. And um, the death of Massa was the start of this, but this is this is going on and the fight will continue. Thank you so much, Ned. I, I really appreciate you coming in and sharing your perspectives with us. Um, very important for you to be able to to speak your mind on this on this topic. Um, one of the things that you talked that you touched on um, just now was the fact that um, this uh, protests have expanded beyond just hijab. It's it's not solely about hijab uh, now, and it's not solely um, women that are protesting. It's all sectors of society. Um, and so with that in mind, have, and this is again for you as a follow-up, has the reactions that you've seen, the, the amount of protests, the scale of protests, is that something that you would have expected, or is this um, is this something completely different than 
than than anything that you would have uh, than anything that you would have expected. Um, actually, um, I did expect this because uh, this is not the fight that started today or last week. This this has been going on for years, as I mentioned before. And uh, this is not something new. People have been protesting for so many years, and it was just a matter of time for this to happen. We all knew that it's going to happen. We just didn't know the time that it's going to happen. And um, there are so many uh, things that um, people are uh, fighting for to get their rights back. And I think um, one of them, I, I want to mention, so, there are so many things that I want to mention. But uh, there are so many that I, I have to count, like the women don't have the right, right to ride a bicycle. They don't have the right to go swimming in open seas. They don't have the right to divorce. They don't have the right to um, uh, go dancing, go like partying, uh, sing. They don't have the right to anything. And um, these rights have been ignored and um, many people did fight for it. But it has been ignored for so many years that so many people are living that, that life in my country and they are thinking that this is the normal life, but it's not. And right now, people want those rights back because they realize that they can take the, their rights back. And this fight is really important for us, for all of us, not just for women, also for men, uh, because they are suffering from difficulties as well just as women, women do. And um, I just want to say that um, some of my experience as well with morality police that uh, happened to me when I was younger that um, like Massa, I, um, I was chased with poli police and uh, just because I, I wasn't wearing something proper to them. And I remember I, I just ran away. I just ran in the streets and tried to hide. But it was very fierce. I was terrified. Um, but I haven't. I hadn't done anything wrong, and um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to sit, tell myself like, why am I being chased? I didn't do anything wrong. Like just because some of my hair is shown, and um, that was the. I think that was that's when you understand that um, you understand that you have to get your rights back because you don't want to be treated that way. And by police, police should be someone who protects you, uh, who tries to give you comfort, not to chase you and tries to annoy you for things that you haven't even done any mistakes. And I, I think right now all people in my country understands that that um, police should be on the side of people, not against them. And that's why they are fighting uh, for uh, fighting for our rights. Thank you so much, Ned. I, I really appreciate your voice on this. Um, I, we have now on the line uh, Dr. Rochendel, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think we're going to go ahead and jump into uh, the, the second question that I had prepared for for him. Um, based on what you've seen um, and the, the stories that you've seen um, online and such from news media, is is this some is this a surprise to you? Is this something that that you um, expected or the protests that you see uh, something that was inevitable? Um, how do you view that? From from your perspective as an as Iranian American and um, an expert in this field. Okay, so Dr. Uh, Rochandel, you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. There we go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, quite honestly, as a scholar who follows day-to-day -day development on the issue and has given many, many interviews to Farsi-speaking media abroad, I can tell you the reaction to the tragic death of uh, this 22 years old girl 
followed by several others so far, was quite expected. Some of these young girls and boys are under age of 18. And it, it's in fact a crime committed by an oppressive state that must be held responsible by international authorities. The reaction are unprecedented, but completely expected. The regime has always suppressed such reactions and usually blamed them acting as a spies and elements of US and Israel that they consider as hostile state. Number of dual citizen prisoners in Iran is a good example to remember how many Iranians have been detained in Iran while they try to visit their family in their own country of birth. So in fact, initially, though the event was very tragic, many people did not feel it's going this deep into the society. The death of this young girl who had traveled from a Kurdish state to the capital city of Tehran to visit her family members. But they were wrong. Many others were right. In fact, it did have such a strong driving engine and triggered the continuation of protests in Iran. At that time, which is almost three weeks ago, I should, uh, I should say that the name of Zina or Gina, meaning life, brought a new life, not only to the women, but also to the society in Iran. Perhaps as in part, it's because of the power of social media we have witnessed global support for the biggest protests of the century. The Iranian diaspora today is not the same as it was 20 or 30 years ago. Millions of Iranians live abroad in every single corner of the free world. Many here in the United States, Canada, Europe, and they are active members of their society and they participate in their local and international politics. As a citizen of the country where they live, the Iranian diaspora has the same rights and privileges as others and can pressure their government to react and not stay silent about this crime and suppression while the people in Iran do not have the same right. But still, this is what they have done. The social move of the diaspora has put the issue at the front line for the international media and governments worldwide. This international support in return has encouraged the younger generation in the streets of Iran. And of course, it has frightened the suppressive Islamic state of Iran to the point that they continue to impose restrictions on the use of the internet and access to the source of media uh, for, for their own people. I wanted to just put one more bring one more aspect of this uprising. I call it a feminist revolution. While it has the support of the entire country, irrespective of their gender. So the unifying slogan of women, life, liberty, makes it distinct from all previous uprisings. And even though women's leadership plays a major role, there is no gender divide.
thank you very much. Um, and I'll come back to you in a, in a, a few minutes as we have uh, as we field some questions from the audience. But first, the last question I wanted to direct towards Drs. Russell and Cook. It seems that um, it seems that the difference in views, obviously, between the religious conservative leadership and those of the protesters are intractable. How do you see this situation playing out over the next few weeks and months? Is there a room for a peaceful solution or is this uh, a regime uh, endangering type of protest? I, I see a lot more violence in the future and I see a pattern um, in the foreseeable future, much like we saw in 1979, particularly as we see all these deaths escalating and we don't even know how many. I, I saw the random figure of 131 and I, I don't even know if, as Netta said, if that's correct. Um, we've all seen a different uh, number. 40 days after each death, there's going to be a commemoration of the individual who died. And when there's a commemoration of the individual who died, there's going to be another round of protests. And with each round of protests, there's going to be another round of repression. And the cycle will keep enveloping. And I see just a kind of repetition, repetition, repetition of the same pattern. Dr. Cook, what are your thoughts on this? Well, there's really three possible outcomes, right? One is that you have a continued suppression of, of the violence. Another one is that government gives in to some extent and, and loosens hijab regulations or other things. And the final one would be revolution by the people and overthrow the government. Um, suppression of the violence, as, as Dr. Russell discussed, um, is probably the most likely of those. Um, the government has already said in the past that they can't give in on some of the regulations because if they give in on the hijab rules, well, then what's going to be the next thing that the people are asking for? What's going to be the next demand um, for increased freedoms? And it's, it's kind of a slippery slope argument um, that the government itself makes. And so it's highly unlikely. There's not a precedent for it. And it would send a dangerous message to the people that protests can bring about change. And the government doesn't want that out there. Um, suppression of violence is is more likely, um, and in fact, it is a, a a tactic that is intentionally used by um, revolutionary organizations. Um, and the, the the whole goal is to provoke the government to suppression and repression and violence, so that it appears in the news media and creates international consternation, international condemnation of the behavior. And so the whole idea is that the message isn't necessarily for the government of Iran, which has proven itself to, to not listen to such protests, but it's to the international community that Dr. Rochendel was referring to. Um, now, as Ms. Uh, Safari said, the problem is, is that right now, from what I've been reading, and you're totally right about the number of casualties, um, and, and this is another thing that Americans don't understand about authoritarian governments. We are so like so socialized to believe in freedom of the press that we don't understand that there are places in the world where the press simply is not free, and neither is social media. And so some of the reports I was reading recently were saying that the, the internet predictably goes out every day for, um, if not longer, it goes out from three or four o'clock in the afternoon when the workday ends until midnight or one o'clock in the morning um, in order to keep messages and images about what's going on from getting out to the international community. Um, and so that could be one of the challenges that the protesters will have to overcome um, is that in a society with free media, we would get the kind of coverage that might help bring about the ends that, that they're looking for. Um, but when the government has such tight control on information, it becomes very difficult to know exactly what is going on um, and and how and to learn about the repression that government is committing. Okay, thank you. I have a few questions coming in now in the chat. And I appreciate those of you who are able to uh, to um, ask those questions. The first one is uh, I believe for Ms. Safari. It is 
Um, and you, you touched on this a little bit, but you did mention some of the gender discrimination um, that uh, women experience in Iran. Can you touch on a little bit more? I guess the question is generally, what are some of the other um, discriminatory, discriminatory practices that women face in Iran? <laughs> Yeah, as I said, uh, thank you for asking that question. As I mentioned, there are so many things that I wasn't able to count all of them because there are so many. Um, I just want to start with saying that uh, many people think that we want, um, we don't want to force uh, the hijab rule, like saying that everyone should be without any hair cover or something like, or like, you know, forcing anything. We just want to have the freedom of choosing the hijab that we want. If either some, someone wants to cover their hair or not, they have to have the right to choose that. And uh, women want the freedom in everything, uh, not just hijab. This is this is started with hijab, but it's not going on with hijab. We don't just require the freedom in hijab and people are protesting for everything, not just for one thing. And um, I, I want to say some of those discriminations. Uh, we don't have the right to choose the religion we want. We don't have the right to work or educate without the if someone uh, someone's husband or dad doesn't let them to do that. They are not allowed to do that. Uh, we don't have the right to divorce, as I said. We don't have the right to go abroad without the permission of a man. We don't have the right to go to check into hotel by ourselves. Um, we don't, and um, many applications are banned in Iran, and it is right now banned. Uh, like my mom doesn't know how to, like many people don't know how to use, you know, other tools to connect to internet because the internet is like being internationalized and not, inter sorry, nationalized, not internationalized. And they have the internet, but they can use it on just some websites that are working in Iran. And um, they have to use some sort of tools, but not everyone is able, not everyone's phone or like, you know, um, <laughs> computer is connected to that. So they still have restricted uh, internet in that sense. And as they had, in, as we had in 2019, that we couldn't do anything. And it's not just um, uh, people who are like suffering from that. It's the whole country, like the bank system doesn't work many times because, uh, because of the internet. That's why they had to connect it on some hours just because of those necessary things, not just for the people. And um, those are all things that uh, came to my mind. Thank you, uh, Neda, again. Another question came in. Uh, this is uh, related to some of the things I believe that Dr. Cook mentioned about um, um, corruption and such. And this probably would be a question for either of the political scientists. But do you believe that sanctions can affect uh, the corrupt officials um, in Iran and, and make change and can we make changes externally through the mechanism of sanctions? Well, we've proven time and time again, if you if you look at the literature, the, the literature basically says that sanctions don't work. What sanctions end up doing is, you know, the goal of the sanctions is to change elite behavior, but what it ends up doing is punishing the powerless. Um, and they're the ones that have to go without. Meanwhile, um, they actually stimulate the growth of black markets in most countries where they've been applied. And that and that allows the elites to actually prosper um, under the system of sanctions. And so um, typically speaking, you'll see the elites still having access to whatever they need. They're going to pay more for it, but they'll still have access while the regular people and poor people um, suffer extensively. Um, now, the one case that's held up in the literature as being successful, um, a, a successful use of sanctions was apartheid in South Africa. And the reason that sanctions were seen as being are, are deemed to have, well, they were effective, but the reason that people point to is that unlike in many other countries and situations, you have you had the public support for the goal of the sanctions. Right. And so if the public in the country where the sanctions has been have been levied um, support the sanctions, then they will not work to circumvent the sanctions and that can help to make them more effective. Um, I think we, it's, it's important to keep in mind that we have a tendency to see the peoples of a government as being kind of monolithic, that they all have the same beliefs and, and value systems and and 
and wants, um, but we're increasingly seeing that there's dissent among some, even some of the clerics in Iran um, about the direction that the government is going and and some members of government and, and people and powerful people in society. If those people supported the goals of the sanctions as well as as your middle and lower class people, um, then it, they may have the potential to work. But most of the time, sanctions are just completely ineffective because they just hurt the wrong people. I see. A another question has come in, um, and this would probably be for Dr. Russell or Ms. Safari. What can ECU students, faculty, and staff do to support our Iranian students here at ECU? I think this question is better for Netta. <laughs> Um, I think the, in that um, people can spread the news, talk about it, be our voice. That's what Iranian people need because, as I said, many don't have internet, they don't have the access, they cannot talk, they are afraid that they will be arrested, they are afraid that they will be killed, and I'm not blaming them. So what others in abroad can do is that to speak up, to talk about the issue, uh, to post it on social media, this is a very good platform. I'm glad that ECU gave us this chance to speak because it awares people. And um, I just want to share the awareness to more people that what is going on in Iran, people have to know, uh, especially students and faculty members. It's more important for the universities that people in the universities know that what is going on in Iran. And um, that is the biggest help, I think. And you know, I'll say that as a member of the Middle East Studies Association of North America, just yesterday, um, you know, my organization as a professional organization just issued a statement of condemnation you know, yesterday. So uh, everywhere professional organizations and syndicates are coming together and, and really you know, issuing these types of statements. Well, and you could also, as an ECU student or a citizen of the United States or someone just visiting here, you could write your congressman, write your senator, write the president, um, and ask them to condemn these these act, the act, acts of the government in the strongest words. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, we don't have any more questions coming in at this point, um, so I'm going to go ahead and give um, all of our panelists, um, a, say a minute or so, to go ahead and make any final comments that you want to make, and then we can wrap up. Let's go ahead and start. Um, I guess as we as as we began with uh, Dr. Russell. I guess I would just like to say that um, one place you can keep looking at so, some news, you know, albeit scattered, is through Twitter. Activists do, you know, periodically post. There's some great um, graffiti and images that are are coming out that I find very useful and helpful for understanding the situation. So, you know. Look at look at social media. That's one way to get a little uh, piece of understanding and, you know, keep listening and keep watching. And I, I think Dr. Cook gave a great suggestion about writing your your uh, your congressman and your senator. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Cook, do you have any last? Any last uh, statement? Kind of, kind of following on with um, what Dr. Russell said, I'd say educate yourself. You know, I pointed out a couple of ways that I think American society doesn't understand how other governments function or other societies and cultures function. Educate yourself, learn about it, do some research. Um, you know, look not just at the look at, at, at like scholarly articles, look at what um, human rights organizations are saying. Um, remember that some of the things that you're reading have, well, everything you read has a bias to it, um, but go out and search of the information because you can't help to change the world if you don't understand what's going on in it. Thank you so much for your participation today. And, and finally, I'd like to give the last word uh, to Netta is, um, again, extraordinarily brave. I'm so um, I'm happy that you're able to come and, and, and willing to join us and, and express uh, yourself in, in this manner. So I'll go ahead and give you the last, the last word and then I'll turn it over to Chris. 
Um, thank you very much for ECU for providing this platform for us to be able to speak up and to spread the news about my country. I know many people are fed up with the what is going on in the Middle East and uh, many people are fed up with the you know horrible news that is going on in the internet and they don't want to hear it but this is something important uh, even for feminists for um, human rights activists because uh, we are trying to get our rights back and I know that this will lead somewhere and we'll be able to get our rights back and um, I just want them to like I expect many people feminists and uh, those activists human rights activists to take action and um, to join us and be our voice um, and um, that's all thank you Thank you. I, I wanted to check in to see if uh, Dr. Rochendel is still on the is still on the call or not, and if so, um, I'll allow him to say uh, to wrap up as well. I, I apologize. Uh, I can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. The, well, if if I have a few minutes. I would like to mention that the Islamic Republic of Iran is one of a few states that has not signed UN Convention on Elimination of, of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Therefore, discrimination exists in Iranian law and practice that is derived from a specific interpretation of the Islamic law of Sharia. This has to be stopped. Therefore, international forum and international organizations are a good point to put this pressure on the regime. But to those who hear my voice today, I would like to urge you to talk loud about the situation in Iran. Talk about Mahsa, talk about Nika, Talk about Serena, Nima, and many others who died in the path of liberty and freedom. Many more who are, in, who are currently inhumanely held in morality police detention and security forces jails. Urge your representatives, your congressmen, to act and urge international community to put pressure on the Islamic Republic to stop this suppression. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rochandel. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over um, to Chris to wrap up. Thank you so much for your attendance today. We really appreciate it. And um, not only those of us here, but uh, thank you very much for supporting um, and showing support for our Iranian students who are most affected by the events um, ongoing in Iran. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, on behalf of Dr. Virginia Hardy, Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Dr. Eric Newble, Dr. Dennis McCunney, and Lauren Thorne, who helped put these couple of conversations together, thank you all. I want to thank you to our partners in global affairs and to our panelists today. As has been said multiple times, keep the conversations going. Be informed. Be engaged. Speak up and speak loudly. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us today.